Hi, I'm Winnie Dunn. I'm Professor and Chair of the University of Kansas Department of Occupational Therapy Education. This frequently asked question is about the registration items on the toddler sensory profile. There are several items on the profile registration score that don't seem to fit based on our current beliefs about registration. So let's look a little deeply at this problem so we can understand it together. Someone wrote me about this right after the Sensory Profile 2 came out. They were particularly concerned about the three items that are marked in orange on the slide. So out of the 11 items, three of them on first blush don't look like they fit with our current understanding of low registration. So if we look at these items, um, we think about registration being um, a failure to detect or not noticing things around you at the same pace or rate that other people do. So it seems a little weird that is distracted by noisy settings, pushes brightly colored toys away, and is more bothered by bright lights than other same age children. They don't seem to fit into this pattern um, of not noticing. And so I understood the question. It made me think deeply about registration as well. Let's look into it. When I got this question, I immediately thought about one of my favorite quotes from Peter Doherty, who wrote a book called The Beginner's Guide to Winning the Nobel Prize in 2005. You should totally read it. It's really a great little book. Here's the quote. In science, Knowledge can advance because each additional small step starts from the best possible understanding of the underlying reality. Sometimes, of course, a further experiment proves to be the next big step that shows the earlier conclusion to have been inappropriate or incomplete. The thinking then changes, but the best scientists, like military generals, are always ready to retreat from a position that can no longer be defended no matter how much of their personal reputation has been invested in the enterprise. I have seen a few scientists self-destruct and lose credibility in a spectacular and public way because they were unable to let go of a defunct idea or a flawed experiment. Science is not like politics. There is nothing wrong with changing one's mind when better evidence becomes available. So that is a quote from page 33 of the Beginner's Guide to Winning the Nobel Prize. I like this quote because it reminds us that ideas evolve and so we must be willing to consider new information that makes us think bigger or differently about an idea. So the first thing I decided to do was to turn to the data from our standardization and validity studies to see what I found. The first place I looked was our data that we had just collected. So I looked at all of our analyses and I found out that the three items in question loaded the most strongly with registration in our factor analyses and our correlational studies. They also were very consistent with the other eight items of this 11 item set. The alpha coefficient which tells us how well the items fit in with each other um, was 0.797 which is very high and when we looked at the correlation with the toddler version of the original infant toddler sensory profile the correlation with the registration score was also 0.797 so somehow we were still capturing the same concepts even though we had some items that were making us feel uncomfortable. Um, I had to think really a lot about this because um, we don't want to be guilty of ignoring really important information. And if we ignore these three items or if we take them out because they make us feel uncomfortable because they don't match our current beliefs, you see what a peril we might create for ourselves because we're denying facts that might inform us because they don't match the current facts that we have. I could liken this to when I um, designed the first 
uh, sensory profiles and looked at what became Dunn's model of sensory processing. Uh, back then, we thought everything would fall into sensory systems, so auditory and visual and touch. And surprisingly, when we did the studies on that original data, the items didn't cluster that way. Um, the seeking factor, for example, had auditory and visual and vestibular and touch items all mixed together. So at that time, we had an idea about sensation, and the data made us think about things that we now take for granted, like seeking and avoiding and registration. So here was another point in time for us to look more deeply. So I decided I needed to look at the larger literature and see what else I could find. So when I looked at the literature, there have been quite a few studies about sensory processing in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, there are also a gathering amount of studies with adults. And in these studies, um, across the studies, we see small but significant relationships between registration scores and things like anxiety, pain catastrophizing, negative affect, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Now we would expect all of these things to have a good correlation with sensitivity and avoiding, which they do. Uh, they do have that, uh, that significant correlation. And there was no relationship to seeking at all, but there was this low and significant relationship with registration in all these areas of study. So it made me really start thinking about what the, the sort of everyday characteristics of people with low registration might be. So here is the moment when we have to think big about our ideas and be courageous enough to embrace the evidence, trusting that it is telling us something important. So I kept thinking, why? Why is this happening? And here's what I think. I think the reason that there are small but significant relationships with registration is that those who initially fail to detect, which is what a person with low registration does, at some point those people do notice the stimuli. And sometimes that point where they notice the situation has gotten more intense than it might be for the rest of us. Those with lower thresholds may notice early warning signs like a slight increase in light or noise and act quickly. A person with low registration who fails to detect early may indeed respond at the point in time that the stimulus is too much. So their reaction is unexpectedly big, but it's later in the situation when a bigger response is necessary. Perhaps parents, as our reporters, are telling us that their child has these big reactions sometimes, reflecting this later responding pattern. A child in a more moderate state might respond in a more moderate way, which seems consistent to the parent. Remember, it is the accumulation of responses that creates the score for the child. Here's another thing to think about. If you think about the registration score, if a child gets all threes, that would be um, a total that plots in the much more than other score on the scoring table. If a child got all twos, this would plot in the more than others category. A child has to engage in these behaviors seldom to never to be in the just like others range. That is how uncommon these missing cues registration behaviors are. So if a parent says half the time for the eight items that we see as traditional registration items and almost never for the three items that we tagged in the beginning of this discussion, that child will still have a total score of 27, which is still a much more than other score. So we have to think about the scale and we have to think about the conceptual features of the behaviors we see in people with registration. Not just their immediate responses, but their long-term responses to the same situation. I know this is a lot to think about, but it's really kind of fun, isn't it? Now we understand registration in a whole new way, and if it wasn't for those three items, we wouldn't know this. 
and I'm so grateful to the parents for telling us this information so we can understand a little bit better.